Hello and welcome to Lecture 54 of my class from Data to Decision. I am Chris Mack, your instructor for this class, and in this lecture we'll use R to perform principal component analysis and principal component regression. It will be a fairly brief demonstration. There's a lot that you could talk about and do with principal component analysis, and we're just going to touch on some of the basics. First, I will uh, using this script that's available on the course website, I will uh, load in the set of data we've played with many, many times. This will be a reduced version of the body fat data set. Load it in, and if I were to perform a, a typical linear regression uh, using all of the variables, and then uh, look at a summary of the model, you see that there are a number of variables that have p-values larger than a typical significance level of 0.05. In fact, there's four of them, and there's only two that are statistically significant. That does not mean that all four of them are not statistically significant. As we've seen before, this data set exhibits multicollinearity. Can't remember what that is or how it works. Just go back to the previous lectures where we talked about what multicollinearity is and how to detect it. So we have to deal with it, and one way to deal with it is with principal component analysis. To do that, I am going to first create a version of the data set that has everything except the response variable. Our data set, at it, uh, you see has uh, regressors, weight, chest, abdomen, hip, thigh, and biceps, and body fat is the output, the response variable. And it's in the first column. So I'm going to go over here and create a new body, uh, data set I'll call body fat X. So only the X variables. And I'll do that by taking body fat and subtracting off the first column, deleting the first column. So I just put this minus one. It's a little trick uh, that R allows. If I execute that, now I've got this new data set body fat X, which let's take a look at it. You see, simply has the first column removed. Everything else is the same. I could have also said, give me body fat columns two through seven, but uh, that does the exact same thing in the original data. Uh, but I did minus one to take out a column instead. All right. Now that I have this set of data, I can use a routine called PR comp, which is principal components. It's a this, the typical standard principal component analysis scheme, uh, and it does all the work for you. I will set center equal to true and scale equal to true so that we first center and scale all of our data, as we should, before we do principal component analysis. Now, let us do that. Now, uh, I have this new uh, uh, data set called body fat x.pca has all of the principal components in it. If I look at that, oh, let's see, I'm not going to look at it there. Um, I'll just, I'll look at it in the plot in the summary. That's the easiest way. So I will plot it. Uh, this plot is a type L for line plot. It's a, called a scree plot. It shows us the variances explained by each of the principal components. And the summary shows us what those principal component variant standard deviation, the square root of variances, are. So uh, the first component is explaining well, down here, the cumulative proportion. Uh, it's explaining 84% of the variance, as shown right there. Uh, the second component adds another 7%. The third component adds 5%. The fourth, 1.6. The fifth, 1.4. And the sixth, less than 1%. So we see that most of the variance in the data set is explained by the first principal component. Often we'll look in, at these principal components and say, eh, you know what, these last few, they don't offer much in terms of explanation. I'm going to go to 90 or 95 percent of the variance explained, and then I'll get rid of all the other principal components. So that's one of the approaches you take with principal component analysis. And if these principal components are 
it's useless enough. Um, we can use them as constraints, certain variables from the data set. Uh, if I want to look at the rotation matrix, it's the body fat PCA dollar rotation at out console so I can see the rotation matrix. The rotation matrix is a formula that converts from principal components uh, from, from the original variables to principal components. So for example, principal component 1 is 0.433 times the weight plus 0.409 times the chest plus 0.409 times the abdomen, etc. And so that's essentially the formula for how you get principal component 1 from the other regressive variables. And this is worthwhile looking at because we see the relationships are. If we look at principal component one, the weights for each of the variables are about equal. That teaches you a lot. It basically says principal, principal component one is something like the sum of all the variables. It's something close to the average of each of the standardized and centered, um, and centered and scaled standardized versions of each of the variables. Well, uh, there's a reason for that it's because this particular data set, all the variables are, are highly correlated with each other in a very simple way so that, uh, you know, an average of all of them is, is what the principal component is going to turn out to be. You look at the other principal components and you see both plus and minus signs. You see some um, coefficients are large and some are small. And so they're much more complicated. But the first principal component in this case is a fairly easy one. All right. Let's go through a few things and uh, learn something. Um, for example, if I look at the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix of the original body fat data, I get a set of eigenvalues. Right? The fact that the first eigenvalue is large and the last eigenvalue is small tells us we have a correlation. I can also go to the um, the principal component data. So after I have performed my principal component analysis, the dollar $x sign, the dollar $x variable, is all of the data entered into these principal components. So if I look at that data and I take uh, the variance of it, that is, I create a, a covariance matrix. The diagonal of the covariance matrix be the variance of each of the principal components. Well, the reason I'm looking at that is you can clearly see variance of each of the principal components is equal to the eigenvalue, the correlation matrix of the original data, kind of how it all works. So remember that one of the important properties of every principal component is that it has a mean of zero and a variance equal to the eigenvalue of the original correlation matrix of the original data. And that was just a little mathematical proof for this data set. All right. Another thing we could test is let's look at the correlation matrix of the principal components themselves. All right. So I do the core and then principal component P, or body fat dot PCA. That's my, where I stuck all the principal component results. Dollar sign X is actual principal component values. That is the data set after it's been rotated and matrix. And if I look at the correlation matrix, I easily see that the diagonal is all one and all the other values are zero. That is telling us, as we expected, that principal components are all orthogonal to each other. Another thing that is popular, some people like to do, is to look at the correlation between the original predictor variables and the new principal components. All right, I'm not going to do that here, but if you want to look at this code, uh, what I did is I, I grabbed all of the original data and it appended it to the principal components into one big giant matrix and then looked at the correlation matrix of that. That allows you to see the correlation between the original data and... All right, that's principal component analysis. What I'm going to do now is principal component regression. So I'm going to take the principal components that I have, right, and I'm going to turn it into a data frame. 
by this command, data.frame of principal component values, the dollar $x. And I'm going to add to it the first column of my original data set. Well, that's simply the body fat. That's the response variable. So I'm going to take the principal components and stick as column one but the original body fat response that I'm trying to model. I'll use the cbind command that binds those, the column of one onto all the others, and that will be my new body fat PCA. The other one I call body fat x, so only the x values. This one's got the x and the response. All right. I'll execute that. Stick as the column name, that first column body fat, and now I have a new data frame which I can look at and we see it's got body fat in the first column and then each of the principal components after that. Okay, what can we do with that? Well, one thing we can do is we can do a correlation matrix like we normally do. Uh, correlation matrix in this case, I'll, I know that all of the principal components are orthogonal to each other, but I want to know how do they correlate with body fat. And so this shows us what all of those correlations are. We see that the first principal component is highly correlated. Uh, the second principal component is negatively correlated. And then, well, let's see, number three and number six have very small correlations. Uh, I might suspect that those two components are not going to be predictive of body fat. We'll see that when we do our regression. So let's do regression. Well, now that we've got this data set set up the way I want it with the principal components as the regressor variables, body fat, and column one, I can just do a linear model, LM, just like always. Body fat versus everything. Data will be my data frame that I just created. And when I run it, I will get my principal component regression. And here are the results. We see that all the principal components, one through six, are represented. We see that two of them, number three, number six, are not significant statistically. They have p-values bigger than 0.05 or 0.01. All the other ones are statistically significant. Now, this is very easy to interpret the principal components because they're all orthogonal to each other. I don't have to worry about multicollinearity. I know that if I see two variables that have p-values for their coefficients that are larger than my significance level that I can decide to ignore them. I don't have to think that they might be correlated with each other because I know they're not. They're orthogonal. It makes analysis of the model extremely easy. I could just go and quickly throw away those two terms from my model if I wanted to. As an aside, we sometimes want to convert terms of our model, principal component model, back into coefficients of the original variables. We can do that. If I take the coefficients of my uh, regression, my principal component regression, take all the coefficients except the intercept. So I do this minus one to get rid of the intercept. The rest of it is a, a vector of all the coefficients that aren't the intercept. And I matrix multiply by the rotation matrix of my original principal component analysis. And so this parentheses star, or excuse me, percent star percent matrix multiplication. I do that matrix multiplication and I get the coefficients, the betas of the original model terms. So if I were to use my centered and scaled model term weight, chest, abdomen, hip, thigh, and biceps, these are all the coefficients of those six terms uh, based on my principal component regression. I could as well get rid of the two non-significant parameters and do a model that says body fat versus PC1 plus PC2 plus PC4 plus PC5, throwing away the two terms that aren't important. I run that model. Now I have a reduced model with only four principal components involved, and it gives me just about the same R squared and uh, adjusted R squared, let's see, it's 0.725. What was my old adjusted R squared? 0.725, all right? So it didn't change the adjusted R squared at all. Um, 
0.7251. What is it here? 0.7251. The same. If I wanted to, I could compare those two models with ANOVA. Right? We talked about one's a subset model of another. We can use the ANOVA function to do an F test. And the F test comes back with a p value of 0.76 that says. There's no statistically significant difference between model one and model two. Um, other things we could do, I'll leave it to you, the interested uh, R user, to download the script and you could try running, finding the best subset model using the uh, heaps library, egg subsets, regression subsets routine that we've already talked about. And Finally, sorry, uh, I'll mention that there is another routine in the, excuse me, in the PLS package that does principal component regression. Kind of all the steps that I just outlined combined all together so that you don't have to do them manually. Um, disadvantages, well, the manual way allows you to do principal component analysis first and then principal component regression. And I think that's very valuable. However, if you only want to go straight to principal component regression, no analysis, you can use these routines here, and I'll leave it up to you to give it a try. Thank you for listening.